I just want to sing that bridge one more time, church. Really grab onto it this morning. What he did on the cross for us means that we are free. We are free. We were meant to have an eternity in hell. And what he did for us, should we choose to accept him as our Lord and Savior of our life, means that we get to live in freedom today. Amen. Let's sing. Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you.
We're gonna continue on in this worship with offering. You know, it reminds me of Mark 12, the story that, that Jesus sees. Um, he's in the temple and he's watching all these various people, uh, rulers, Pharisees, give offerings to the Lord. And lo and behold, he sees this little old woman with only two cents in her hand, all that she has. She walks over to the temple offering buckets and gives it. And Jesus says something incredible because everyone else gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her sacrifice. She gave because she loved God so much, believed in God so much that God was everything to her and God blessed her for that. Yes, God asked us to give, but not because we have to, but because out of love, out of obedience, out of our worship for the Lord our God. So today, this morning, as we do the offering, out of the abundance of your heart, give to the Lord as worship. Father God, we just thank you so much for this time, Lord. We pray that as we give to you, that you would speak to us, that you would move in our hearts, oh God. We know that we can never outgive you. So Lord, let your will be done here and now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
if you could direct your attention to the screens, we have some announcements for you this morning. Hey, we have a few. Welcome Center after church, we want to get a gift to you guys. Hi, for those of you who haven't taken the membership class, we have membership on March 10th at 2 p.m. Learn about who we are and what we believe and become a member. Join us on March 10th right after service. Youth and kids are doing a fundraiser called Sweet Fiesta. We will have tacos and baked goods. So make sure you bring the cash because it's for the children. <laughs> Hey Church family, join us on March 16th at 9 a.m. for our Women's Journal Through the Bible. This is a great time for us to reflect on God's Word and journal together. We also will be having a movie afterwards at 11 a.m., so bring your blankets! We also have our Foundations class on March 18th at 6.30 p.m. Learn about biblical truths and grow in your faith. And don't forget to sign up on Church Center. On Sunday, March 24th, right after church, the Second Wind Group is gonna go to Stonefire Grill for lunch. Let Jay know if you're willing to drive and bring money for your own food. Hey, Restoration Church, I just wanna invite you out to a very special Good Friday service, March 29th at 7 p.m. in the main sanctuary. It's gonna be a worship night, you guys, from seven to nine. We're even gonna have worship stations. We're just so excited to have you guys come on out, bring your friends, bring your family. We can't wait to see you. Hey, church family, how you doing? Pastor Kevin here. I know, Emmy. We just wanted to invite you to our Easter service, March 31st at 10.30 a.m. Bring a friend, bring your family, bring everybody. <laughs> yeah, right? We want them to hear the gospel, be radically changed. We pray that they would leave differently than the way that they walked in. So come early. You could come as early as 9 a.m. and get some coffee and pastries. But we hope to see you there. Yes, join us. God bless. Happy birthday, Restoration Church. What's going on? On April 14th, don't make any lunch plans because we got lunch covered for you. We're going to have tacos outside, so come have a blast. All right, guys, that's going to do it for our announcements. Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts to hear the word. Hey, everybody, my name is Kyle. We have a few announcements for you guys. Hey, church. All right, how's everyone doing this morning? Oh, we could do better than that. How's everyone doing this morning? That's what I'm talking about. Hey, God bless you. We just want to welcome you to Restoration Church. My name is Kevin Moore. I'm the lead pastor here. And we are one church that meets in two locations, in person and online. Whichever fashion you're with us this morning, we're just so thankful that you're here. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And man, you did it. Can you just give yourself a hand clap this morning? You're like, what am I clapping for? You did it. You had to spring forward, and you still made it to church. I love you. God bless you for that, right? Um, how many of you guys know, um, well, well, before I ask you a question, let me, let me just say this. Has anybody ever been stuck before? Whether, whether you're stuck in an elevator, stuck waiting for the bathroom, right? Your sibling won't get out. You're try, you, you know, whether you're stuck in a line somewhere, stuck in traffic. Has anybody ever been stuck before? Well, in life, there's a lot of things that we can get stuck in. We could get stuck in a fence. We could get stuck in our thoughts. We could get stuck in our trauma. We could get stuck in the past. We could get stuck in our feelings sometimes, stuck in distraction, even worse, stuck in addictions, right? Stuck in the mud if you go, uh, you know, off-roading. Uh, but I'll tell you this, that Jesus has come to set the captives free. Jesus has come to deliver those who are stuck in something and get you free, get you to the other side of that thing that the enemy would want to keep you in, amen? Jesus says in John 8, 36, therefore if the Son makes you free, you shall be free what? Indeed. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free what? Indeed. Indeed. My prayer is that every week as we talk about different topics, that you would be set free from the things that the enemy would love to keep you stuck in. Today the title of my message is Stuck in Trauma. Stuck in Trauma. On March 23rd, 2012, I went on a trip with four of my friends to lead worship in Reno. 
Some of you have heard this story. If you have, God bless you. Forgive me for sharing it again, but, but I just, the Lord wants me to share this story with the world. I am a, literally a living miracle that I'm standing here this morning before you. March 23rd, 2012, four of my friends and I left to go lead worship in Reno. Well, we left Orange County early that morning. We made a pit stop in Lancaster to meet up with our, uh, our other friends who were a part of my buddy's church. And we were gonna caravan up to, from Lancaster to Reno. Um, little did I know that that day would be one of the most traumatic days of my life. Little did I know, I had no uh, I didn't see it coming. I had no idea that in, in the next few hours that, that my life would forever be changed. As we began driving, my friend mentioned, you know, hey, you know, I know we've been driving through the night. I know we've stayed up, right? We're tired. But you guys put on your seatbelts because I'm not getting a ticket for any of you. As we began to leave his parents' street in Lancaster, I, uh, you know, begrudgingly put my seatbelt on. Normally, that's a, a practice of mine that is no problem. I always buckle my seatbelt. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't a thing where, I, you know, I sometimes don't do it. No, this was a practice of, that I, that I regular, regularly partake in, but this time, there was a struggle because I was tired, and we were half asleep, and so I remember putting my seatbelt on, and it's by the grace of God that I did put my seatbelt on. I'll tell you this, as we drove down the freeway a couple of miles, we realized that we needed to stop and get gas. And so as my friend proceeded down the 14 freeway at Avenue I, we began to merge off to get off of the freeway. The church van ahead of us and us five in this Dodge Ram truck. And as we proceeded to lane change, what happened is we collided with a semi-truck. And if you've ever been to Lancaster, if you've ever, ever been to the Antelope Valley, you know that in certain areas their freeway is up a little bit higher. We were, on a, you know, we were above some dirt. There's a whole lot of dirt in Lancaster. And we were on a dirt embankment. And so we collided with this semi truck. What happened initially is our truck turned this way and we popped up a, 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 over a curve and then we headed straight down and I remember pushing against the floorboard and holding my weight back in my seat with my, the palms of my hands. And I remember looking straight down. It felt exactly like you would imagine it feels, just like a roller coaster. If you've ever been on a roller coaster, it felt exactly the same. We rolled two times and we landed right side up. When we landed right side up, I was okay. I was a little bit shaken, but I was okay. The driver of the vehicle, that uh, our driver, he began to call out the names of each one of my friends to check on us. Kev, how you doing? I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. Jeremy, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Isaac, Sequini, no answer. As we began to kind of gather our faculties, we looked behind and realized that Isaac and Sequini were no longer in the truck with us. They had been ejected from the vehicle when we rolled down this embankment. And so uh, we tried to get out of the car as fast as we could. My door wasn't really, uh, you know, it wasn't easy to open since we rolled on that side. And so I, if I recall correctly, what I did is I tried to open it and force it. It didn't happen. So I grabbed the handle and I kicked against the door and finally got it open. We get out of the car and our initial thing is we got to look for our friends. Where are they? We came around the car, we're looking for them. We found Sequini in the dirt, face down, and the truck tire, the front left tire was on his back. So initially we said, okay, we're gonna try to lift this truck, maybe with adrenaline, maybe with all that, maybe we can do it. And so I grabbed Sequini's legs and we're trying to pull, I'm trying to pull them out as they're trying to lift. It was a failed attempt. At this point, people from the side of the freeway up, up the hill began to get out of their cars, park, and come down and help us. The, the church van up ahead saw the big cloud of dust in the air, and they came back to help us. And finally, we were able to get Sequini out from underneath the truck. Well, shortly after that, we said, okay, now where's Isaac? You have to understand, this was five in the morning. It was actually pretty dark. And we're in the middle of just a, a flat dirt area. And so we could not find Isaac for some time. 
Come to find out we found him, you know, yards away. I don't know how far, I just know he was far, farther than you would have expected. So it was good that we found him, right? He was uh, unconscious, he was doing that, that breathing. If anybody's ever been through a, a life-threatening experience, it's the, it, there's a sound to the breathing that you know it's, it's something's wrong, it's serious. I remember the highway patrol arriving on scene and I remember him rubbing his chest and he said, come on, stay with us, buddy. You know, trying to, to just keep him alert and, 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 you know, alive, right? Keep his brain stimulated. Well, this was a very traumatic experience. After that, we were rushed to the hospital. I can't tell you how many miracles took place, but before I tell you the miracles, I gotta tell you the extent of the, the accident. So we were rushed, uh, you know, they, they rushed my friends to the hospital. I, at the time, uh, got the privilege of riding with a deputy uh, sergeant, and she took me to Antelope Valley Hospital, and uh, my friends were immediately rushed in there, as you could imagine, right? And I remember sitting in the lobby just kind of, they call it shell-shocked. You're just like, whoa, what just happened? Everything happened so fast. And I remember sitting there not knowing the extent of the injuries and the extent of everything. I didn't know if my friends were dead, if they were hanging on to life, or if they were just kind of had some broken bones and were gonna be out in a few days. I didn't know the extent. How many of you know the unknown is a tough place to be? The unknown, man. I remember calling my parents. Hey guys, I'm okay. Six in the morning, right? probably six in the morning at the, around the time I uh, was able to give them a call at the hospital. Hey, I'm okay, but we were in a severe accident. Can you guys come and, and, and come to this hospital, right? Don't know what, what's going, I don't know the extent of what's going on, but this is what happened. They said, we'll be there. They got, they packed up their stuff from Long Beach and got there quickly. Well, I'll tell you this. I was dealing with the trauma of this accident. How many of you have ever been through a traumatic experience before? It doesn't have to be that extreme. It could be less extreme, it could be more extreme, but have you ever been through something traumatic by show of hands? I'm just curious this morning if anybody's ever been through some trauma. Well, I I pray that you would never have to go through trauma but I know that's just not realistic. In fact, in this life, I I could guarantee that at some point or another, you're gonna go through something traumatic. And you're like, whoa, Pastor Kev, don't you wish that upon me? Don't you say that, I don't like that, I don't accept that, I don't receive that. Well, I'm not wishing anything upon you, and, and I'm not trying to put anything upon you, but what I am telling you is that it is a fact of life that you will go through some things. Doesn't mean you will go through tragedy doesn't mean that your experience will be the same. But at some point or another, we all experience trauma. Jesus even told us in John 16, 33, I shared this last week. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. Those are his words. Hey, in this life you're gonna go through some stuff. I pray that it's not to that extreme, but in life we'll go through some things. And there will be trauma that we have to deal with. We all have tribulations. We will all have tribulations, right? We will all experience trauma. And if you're still not convinced, just listen to the very definition of trauma. It may not be what you think. Check this out. The the definition of trauma from the dictionary says, a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. Well, by that definition, I think probably all of us have gone through some trauma before. We've all experienced trauma. Another thing could be physical injury. Now, I want you to know there are different types of trauma because sometimes we hear trauma, we automatically assume tragedy. We automatically assume, you know, uh, the death of somebody, right? That's a form of trauma, but there's all kinds of trauma out there. There's emotional trauma. There's physical trauma. There's traumatic stress. There's sexual trauma, psychological trauma, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's all kinds of trauma, right? There's, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of things. In fact, I'll tell you this, people can experience trauma 
in, in many different ways. You know, if you've ever witnessed a violent crime before, anybody ever see someone get robbed? Anybody ever been robbed before? That's not a fun experience, right? Especially when you find out later it wasn't a gun, it was a banana in their pocket. You're like, oh, I shouldn't have gave him my wallet. No. Um, that can be traumatic. Sometimes uh, people who have gone to war, man, that could be a traumatic experience. People who have experienced loss, grief, that could be a traumatic experience. Something frightening or disturbing, right? Your, your babysitter uh, lets you watch Chucky when you should have never watched that movie. That could be a traumatic experience. Sorry, Pastor Brian, I love you, man. <laughs> I'll tell you this, in life we experience trauma. And if you're still not convinced, I just want to share with you that some of our heroes in the faith, in scripture, went through some trauma. And before I encourage you, I just want to break this down, this idea of trauma first. And so if you're already starting to feel like, why oh, did I come to church today? This is emotionally draining, right? Don't worry, it's going to get better. But I want you to hear the extent of, of damage and the icky before we can get to the good stuff. People in scripture went through trauma. Think about David for a second. David struggled with, with troubling thoughts. He struggled with despair. In fact, Psalm 38, four, <coughs> excuse me, Psalm 38, four says this, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. This is David. My iniquities have gone over my head, they are like a heavy burden, right? Like a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Man, the weight of the world is on my shoulders and I can't do it, Lord. That's in essence what David is saying. How many of you know David, he fought a giant and he won? That's awesome, that's a great story. But did you also know later in David's life that he had made some poor decisions and he dealt with the trauma of those decisions, the consequences of those decisions? He slept with a married woman and he had her husband killed. Right? Can you imagine the, the trauma of carrying the, the guilt and, and having the trauma of knowing that you messed up but also that you, it cost someone else their life? Well, it doesn't get better from there because what happens is he had to deal, because of his sinful actions, he had to deal with some of these consequences. He dealt with betrayal from some of the, the closest ones to him, including his own son. David also went through some trauma. He, he lost a child. He lost that child that, that, that came out of his sinful behavior. Ouch, man, that's traumatic. For anybody that's ever had a, a, a miscarriage before, or gone through something like that, it, it hurts. That is traumatic. What about Elijah? Elijah, he was discouraged and worn down in, in 1 Kings. You know, he, he was... Uh, he, after running from Jezebel, this evil lady who wanted to, to, to kill him, so just... Real quick for you guys, this is, this is just a commercial break. Please know the Bible names and their character before you name your kids a Bible name, right? <laughs> Judas is not a good name for your son. You got to know the story. Jezebel is not a good name for your daughter. I just want to, that's just a little extra for you this morning. Uh, we don't need any little Jezebels running around, okay? We, that's just not a good name, you know, something else. Another, another Bible character, okay? So Jezebel, if you don't know anything about her, she was an evil lady and she wanted to kill the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 19.4, it says this, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. God, just take me out. He feared for his life. And he goes on to say, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. He was done. He was like, I'm over this. I'm over this situation. I don't, you know, I, I'm tired of having to deal with what's right in front of me. And guess what? The Lord wanted to give him the victory the whole time. But he let fear get the best of him. And so God in his faithfulness, what did he do? Well, he was done, but the Lord ministered to him. He gave him a food and a nap. He said, here, here, Elijah, you're not yourself when you haven't had a Snickers. Now take a nap and it'll all be better when you wake up, right? That's essentially what happened. He gave him food, he gave him a nap, and then his perspective was drastically changed, right? 
Hanger is a real thing. You know what hanger is? It's when you're hungry and you have anger. Because you're hungry, that's, it's called hangry. I'm hangry right now. You're angry? No, hangry. I'm hungry and I'm angry because I'm hungry. That's, that's what was happening. So then we talk about Job. We talked about Job last week. Job went through some grief, some loss, illness. I mean, his friends turned on him, right? His own wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, he went through a lot of things. And in fact, Job 3.11 really shows the extent of where he was in all of his trauma as well. Job 3.11, why did I not die at birth, Lord? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? There's this whole chapter of Job saying, why, you know, why did you allow me to be born? Why did you bring me into this earth? Why, 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 why? You have to be pretty discouraged. You have to be pretty traumatized to think these things, to feel this way. And yet at times, we feel that way because we're human and we go through things. We experience trauma in this life. But what I love about all of these stories is that God is so faithful, that we serve a big God, a God who says, I'm not going to leave you there. You forgot that I'm going to carry you through. God doesn't just leave us in our trauma. He doesn't just say, oh, that's all that it is, and life will always be this way. That's what the enemy says. You're stuck. You'll never get out of this. This is too big. It, you've gone too far. There's no remedy for this, and God says, yeah, right, that's all a lie, all a lie. There's no pit too deep that God's love can't pull you out of. There's no stronghold so strong that he can't break the bonds of that thing. There's no chains big enough to hold back the power of God from being able to break them. Can I just get an amen this morning? We serve a big God. These guys went through some trauma, but guess what, they eventually healed from it. How many of you know even our Savior went through trauma? Jesus willfully went through trauma for you and I. How many of you know being beaten to a pulp, being whipped, you know, going through this type of physical harm? How many of you know that's traumatic? Man, I get a paper cut and I remember it. Like, I'm like, I got a paper cut in the third grade. And I remember that hurt so bad. I remember my mom putting peroxide in my cuts, right? And peroxide, that's how you knew she was Christian, right? You people who put alcohol in your kids' cuts, that's demonic. That's from the devil. That burns so bad. Oh, my gosh. Use peroxide. It still cleans, but it doesn't hurt, right? Um, you guys are like, I'm just trying to get back at you from all the misery you put me through. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you, man. Going through what Jesus went through, that's traumatic. That was, that's, I mean, none of us will ever experience that. We may experience some physical pain, right? We may get a wound here and there or something like that, but man, we'll never have to carry the sins of the world. And that punishment was meant for us, but Jesus took it so that we don't have to. <laughs> Literally nailed to the cross, he nailed our sins to the cross so that we have the opportunity to go free if we receive a relationship with him, if we receive his free gift called salvation. I love that he resurrected though. He didn't stay stuck in his trauma. He didn't stay down, but he got up. I'm, I love that about our Savior. In this life, we will all experience some form of trauma. But I want you to know today that just because you experience trauma doesn't mean that you have to stay stuck there. Satan's plan is to keep you right here in your trauma. If you want to know the devil's plan for you, you're looking at it. God, it was so traumatic. Oh, can't believe that happened to me. This is the enemy's plan for your life. He wants to keep you stuck in your trauma, but Jesus went to the cross so that you can be free. Have you ever noticed that uh, society's full of victims? You ever noticed that? Oh, if you haven't noticed, start paying attention. I promise you, you will see this, that society is full of 
victims, and not just victims, right? Everyone can be a victim of something. It's not, it, you have no control over that, but I'm talking about people with a victim's mentality. There's a big difference. Victim of something is an event. Staying a victim is a choice, right? Uh, there are a lot of people who have decided that being, a, because they were a, a victim in a scenario, that that's what they will always be, and that's, who their ide- that's what their identity is. No, I'm just a victim. And they make support groups and, and for, for victims, and, and this becomes a part of who they are. Oh, the church hurt you? Oh, they hurt me too. Come on. Come on in here. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I hate the church. I hate, the, I hate Christians. You know what they did to me? I was serving and this and that. Yeah, come on. Come on. Come hang with me. Victim mentality. Let's stay stuck in it. Oh, you were abused? Oh, so was I. I hate those people. Come on. Come on. Come on. It could, there's room for you in here. Come on. We can hang. But what we need more of, church, is people who say, man, I, I, I understand that you were a victim in that situation. I understand that you went through some trauma but we serve a God who is way too big to let you stay in the prison, in the jail cell of your traumatic experience, and he wants to see you get free, and I wanna help you meet this God. I wanna help you walk with the Lord. I wanna help you to get out of trauma. You don't need to live your life in the prison cell of trauma. You know why? Point number one today is because your identity is not in your trauma. Oh, I'm a survivor and a victim of this. I was a victim of this. I was a survivor of this. I, I, was, I was this, you know. I still carry around this hurt. I still carry around this wound. You can be a survivor. You can be somebody who's been delivered from it, but don't live in the, the prison cell of trauma to where you say, you know, you're, you're stuck there. Man, life ended when that traumatic thing happened. Don't allow that in your life because your trauma is not your identity. The world might try to give you that as, as your, your, your name, right? As your identity. The world might try to give you that description. Oh, you've been through this, so you're that. No, no. I, I'm saved and delivered. And my past is behind me. And those things that have happened to me, God is aware of. He's healed me from. And now I can move forward. I'm not my trauma. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christ follower. I'm a new creation. I'm a child of the king. I'm not my car accident. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not that guy who, whose life ended on, on that road. In fact, my life probably would have ended had it not been for the hand of the Lord being upon me. I'm living on borrowed time, and so I'm not going to stay stuck in March 23rd, 2012, where, where I got this trauma, the traumatic experience that happened to me. No, no, I'm going to move forward for the glory of God. I'm gonna move forward from that and God's gonna get the credit and the glory and people who know about my car accident are gonna know more about my God. So I wanna tell you this morning, you don't have to adopt a victim's mentality. Even if you were a victim of a bad situation, you can be victorious in Jesus. And I'm not here to minimize your pain. I'm not here to say that it's not valid. I'm not here to say that you weren't a victim of something. No, no, we all are at some point or another. But I'm here to tell you that that doesn't have to be your identity. That doesn't have to be where you stay. Your life doesn't have to end in that trauma. God wants to move you past that thing and give you a testimony, a story of how he brought you through that. Yes, I experienced trauma, but I'm celebrating that what the enemy meant for evil, God turned around for my spiritual good, amen? He took my test and he, what, he gave me a testimony. That's just a fancy Christian word for, uh, if you're not fluent in Christianese, don't worry, I'll help you out. That's a Christian word for a story. He, he took your trial and he gives you a story out of it, of how he's faithful. He takes our mess and he gives us a message, right? Now I've got a story of God's Faithfulness, God's faithfulness in spite of my trauma. You know, Dr. Matthew Stanford says that God doesn't see you as a victim, he sees you as a child. And more specifically, he sees you as his child. Satan's lie though, what is his lie? You'll never get past this. You'll never get out. The enemy wants to keep you bound in here. He wants to lie to you. Let's just say you're going through, you're stuck in the cell of trauma right now. 
and the enemy's telling you, you're never gonna get out of there. Why don't you just throw in the towel? It's not worth even trying. You're not gonna get out of there. You're stuck. But I came to tell some people who feel stuck this morning that you are not stuck, that you are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ, that you have all authority in heaven and on earth from Jesus through his name. You have all the power to overcome those things. And I believe that God wants to set you free from your trauma today. Some of you have been carrying around this hurt and this trauma. You've been doing life in this prison cell for so long and God said it ends today. You don't have to carry that into your future you don't have to let that hinder you from your purpose I believe that God wants to move you forward and give you a story to tell of his faithfulness even in spite of your trauma sometimes we feel stuck sometimes we feel like we hit a wall like like we we just can't get past our trauma But God's word says this in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4. I say this all the time. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill. Now, before you go thinking there's a contradiction, uh, we, we have to kill animals in order to eat, okay? So that's more about what it's talking about. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Some of you thought dancing was a sin. No, dancing's biblical. But twerking is not, okay? You need to keep it under control, ladies and gentlemen. Every season, good or bad, has a beginning and it has a what, ladies and gentlemen? End. Every season, good or bad, has a beginning and it has a what? An end. So don't think that your season of trauma is going to be forever. Don't think that your season of tribulation, that your season of trial is gonna be the rest of your life. Every season has a beginning and every season has an end. There is a winter, it has a beginning and an end. There is a summer, it has a beginning and an end. There is a time where we have to set our clocks back and there's a season where we got to set our clocks forward. Oh gosh, right? I wish that, you know, instead of spring forward and fall back, I wish it could be fall back and then spring back even further. One more hour, right? But that's not the reality of life. Every season has a beginning and an end. Just because you feel something now doesn't mean that it will always be that way. Your trauma is not your identity. God wants to set you free from your trauma. Psalms 91, three through nine says this, surely, somebody say surely. Surely. Not the lady, but surely, certainly, he shall deliver you from the snare. You know what the snare is? It's not the the instrument with the drums, right? It's not, not a snare drum. Snare, he's talking about traps. Surely he shall deliver you from the traps of the fowler. Who's the fowler? The hunter, right? The one who traps birds. This is the analogy being used here. Surely God will deliver you from the traps that the enemy set out against you and from the perilous pestilence. Verse four, he shall cover you. Somebody say cover. Cover. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. You know what refuge is? Refuge is shelter from the storm. You shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Is that not a word of comfort for someone going through something today? No matter what comes your way, God is your refuge. No matter what the enemy uses against you to try to take you out, God is going to give you the victory over that snare, uh, the snares of the fowler, right? He's gonna give you the victory over the the traps of the enemy. He's gonna take that assignment that was meant uh, uh, against you and he's gonna flip it on the enemy. He will use it for your good and for his glory. 
God will deliver you, deliver you from trauma if you will let him. This morning, turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 4, and then go a few more pages and put your finger on chapter 9, because we're going to jump ahead after this. So 2 Samuel 4.4, 4. but before I read that, I want to let you know that I want to talk to you about this guy named Mephibosheth. Can we try to say that together? This will be fun. Say Mephibosheth. So Fibosheth, what'd you say? <laughs> that was good. Some of you got it. Some of you were like, <laughs> I don't know. What that was. Hey, good job. Good job, right? Like, this is a hard word to say. And I just want to give you a disclaimer now. Um, at some point or another in my message, I will say this name wrong. But I just want you to hear me say it right. Mephibosheth, okay? I know how to say the word. But eventually when it comes out wrong, you know what I mean, okay? So just be like, "Mm mm-hmm, we know what you mean, Pastor. You said McDonald's, but I still understand you meant Mephibosheth. All right, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, and he was the grandson of Saul. Not Saul of Tarsus, but Saul, King Saul. When his nurse heard that the Philistines had killed Jonathan, Mephibosheth's dad, and you can read about this in Isaiah uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, not Isaiah, 1 Samuel 31, I read my notes wrong, 1 Samuel 31, um, you can read how Jonathan was killed and, and how Saul, he fell on the sword and, and, and it was just a, a sad day. Well, when Jonathan, um, excuse me, when Mephibosheth's nurse heard that the Philistines had killed Jonathan, she decided to flee with the boy, the boy being Mephibosheth, to a safer location. 2 Samuel 4.4 4 tells us about this, but what happens is it turns into a traumatic event. It's already traumatic, but it becomes more traumatic, like a snowball effect. So it says this, 2 Samuel 4.4, 4, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame in his feet. Who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled, and it happened as she made haste to flee, it happened as she was hurrying to get out of there, it happened as she was running with the boy, that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So what, what's going on here? Well, in one day, Mephibosheth's life was completely transformed. He went through a very traumatic experience at five years old. In her flight, in her running away, she dropped Mephibosheth and and he became permanently crippled in both feet. In one day, being five years old, he, he, he lost his uncles, he lost his grandpa, and he lost his dad. He lost his ability to walk without assistance, right? And not only that, you have to understand who his grandpa was. His, his grandpa was a king. You have to understand that, that there are benefits that go with being in a royal bloodline, but not when your whole family is murdered. Not when your whole family's killed. He lost his royalty in this moment. I, I, I would say that at five years old, he, he pretty much lost everything near and dear to him. In one day, Turn with me just a few chapters over to 2 Samuel 9. We'll start in verse 1. 2 Samuel 9, verses 1 through 13. It says, now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul? Who's David? King David. David was the one who became king and seceded uh, Saul, right? And now there was a time being where there was some drama and all these things going and, and, and Saul's reign was coming to an end and God was platforming David. And, uh, but there was, this, there, there was a time of some overlap going on. But you need to know that David is the king, right? David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? What you need to know is that Saul had a son named Jonathan. Tra- track with me here today, right? Saul had a son named Jonathan. Jonathan and David were like best buds. They were like more than best buds. They were brothers. Brothers from different mothers, right? I mean, they were, they were brothers, right? Um, and Jonathan was loyal to David even over his own father. Saul wanted to kill David because he was jealous. 
He wanted to kill David, but, but Jonathan would go and warn David, hey, this are my father's plans. Not only that, he would try to talk. Jonathan would try to talk to Saul and say, Father, why don't we just stop pursuing David? Let's do something else. We have other things to worry about, right? So Jonathan stuck his neck out for David. And so David and Jonathan, at one point in there, in all of this drama unfolding, they made a covenant with each other. They made, a, they made an agreement with each other. They said, you know what, I'll always take care of, uh, of your family, you, and thank you for always taking care of me, right? They, they were boys. They were brothers, man. They, they, they had different families, but they were, I mean, they had a, a love for each other, right? And so they made this covenant, and so David is honoring this. He said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness, not for Saul's sake, but for Jonathan's sake, my friend who is no longer alive, right? And, and verse two says this, and there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they called him to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service, right? Oh man, I feel like that's still like from Beauty and the Beast, right? It's to say like, at your service, right? It's just perfect, I could see it. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul uh, to whom I may show the kindness of God and Ziba said to king, well, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Okay, why, why was that necessary for you to say he's lame in his feet? Couldn't you have just said, yeah, there's, there's one guy, his name's Mephibosheth, right? I want you to take notice of that. Every time we have read about Mephibosheth, it's like his condition is mentioned with it. His label goes before him. But here's the thing, that's not the label that God has given him. That's the label that man has attached to him. This world will try to give you labels, ladies and gentlemen, but your, true, your truest identity is not in the labels that this world may give you, but rather in the labels that your heavenly Father has given you. He has put his DNA inside of you. You, you have the fingerprint of God inside your DNA. You have a, a heavenly Father who loves you, and if you feel like an orphan, guess what? You have a heavenly Father who says, when your mother and father forsake you, God will take you in. He wants to adopt you into his family. You have purpose and you have value. And no label that anyone could ever attach to you could change who you really are because what God says about you is the truest thing because he created you. He's the only one with the authority to define you. Every time we read about Mephibosheth, his condition is mentioned. David could have asked, uh, you know, David could have told Ziba, did I ask if his feet didn't work? Did I ask if he was lame, right? I just asked if there was someone in the household of Saul that I could bless for Jonathan's sake. But he didn't. David went along with the program. Verse four, he says this. He says, so the king said to him, well, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. Somebody say Lodabar. Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now what you need to know about Lodabar is sometimes we pass over these things and we miss some of the richness of Scripture when we just pass over, when we just skim through, when we just go over the surface. Lodabar was a town on the other side of the Jordan, but the literal translation of the Hebrew word Lodabar is pastureless. What did that mean? The outskirts. What did that mean? It meant that it was a desert wasteland, that it was not, a pretty, it was not like a, a pretty place to live. It was not a nice neighborhood. It was the outskirts of town. So Jonathan, excuse me, not Jonathan, so Mephibosheth was living on the outskirts. He was a, a cripple. He was outcast in Lodabar. He wasn't with the, the townspeople. He was on the outside looking in. Went from being a, a, a child, a, a grandson of the king, to living in the outskirts. Verse six, now, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. So Ziba goes, he brings Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth comes before King David, and ultimately he's like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? He's gonna take me out, he's gonna kill me. I don't know what I did wrong. Have you ever got sent to the principal's office before? Have you ever got called into the principal's office? Oh, I had to get called into the, uh, the, the counselor's office one time, and that was scary. 
It's like, man, even if I didn't do anything wrong, I'm still questioning, what did I do wrong, right? It's, nothing raises your anxiety, right? Some of you, you feel that way when I call you and to have a meeting with you. Sometimes I'm just calling to say, hey, how you doing? Is your family doing good? How can I pray for you, right? But it's this feeling that you get before going to somebody in leadership. Oh my gosh. So Mephibosheth said, here is your servant. Please don't kill me. That's what that's code for, right? So David said to him, hey, do not fear. I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore you to all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. I want you to know that sometimes people, again, they try to label others or try to label us by our trauma, by our weaknesses, by our handicaps, but I love, I love, I love, I love. Did you pick up on something? I love that David called him not by his trauma, not by his handicaps, not by his weakness, but by his name. He didn't say Mephibosheth who's lame in both feet. Good to see you. He didn't say, hey cripple, good to see, no, he said Mephibosheth. Our identity is not in our trauma. Our identity is in who the king says that we are. The king doesn't call us by our misfortune. He calls us by our name. Your trauma is not your identity, ladies and gentlemen. Who does God say that you are? So he calls him by his name. But look what happens, though. Then he bowed himself, and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? This is how he thought of himself. He believed the lie. He remained stuck in his trauma. He remained in the prison cell of trauma. He, he remained, you know, that wounded young boy from five years old who lost everything. I moved the whole jail cell. That's the power of the Lord right there. You seen that? It might be on wheels. I'm not sure. Just kidding. He was stuck in the jail cell of his trauma. Mephibosheth says, what do you want with a dead dog like me, David? How many of you know a dead dog is not valuable? If any of you think a dead dog is valuable, we'll, we'll talk afterwards. But I'll just, I'm just going to help you out this morning. You know, can a dead dog protect your yard? That's not a trick question, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I love you guys. Can a dead dog protect your yard? Is anybody going to bark if it, it, you know? No, they're not going to bark. Dead dog can't protect your yard. Can a dead dog play fetch? Go get it. It's going to be one-sided game. I'm just telling you right now, that dog's not going to go get that stick. Can a dead dog, right, come and comfort you? No. He is saying, in essence, David, what do you, what do you want with someone like me? I have no value. I'm, I'm as worthless as a dead dog. I see myself as, as somebody with no value, no, what, what do you want with me, man? I'm, I'm, I'm a cripple who lives in the outskirts of town. You know, I, I lost everything when I was five years old and it's just all my life amounts to. I was, I was somebody who was going to have a good life, but I, I just don't, I don't. I'm a dead dog, David, what do you, what do you need me for? Can you, can you sense that in, in the text this morning? What do you want with a worthless person right me? He was still stuck in his trauma. He was doing life from the prison cell of his hurt, from the prison cell of his trauma. At five years old when he lost everything, he was living life from that place. But I've come to tell you something today, ladies and gentlemen. The king didn't care about any of that. The king showed compassion and love. The king didn't care about the fact that Jonathan, you know, um, that, excuse me, the king didn't care about the fact that, that Mephibosheth's feet didn't work or, or that, you know, that he had limitations. He didn't care about any of those things. You know what he cared about? He cared about the fact that he was related to Jonathan and the fact that David and Jonathan made a covenant that David would take care of Jonathan's household for helping save his life and, and many, many times against his own father, right? He didn't care about his limitations. He cared about who he was. 
Some of you need to hear this today. He didn't care about his limitations. He cared about who he was. Point number two today is that your value is not in what you can do, but rather in who you are. Your value is not in what you can do, but rather who you are. Some of you are like, wait, what? Yeah, your job is not the greatest thing about you. Your, your diploma, your bachelor's degree, your master's degree, you know, the, the title uh, on, you know, your accomplishments, those are not the greatest thing about you. You know what the greatest thing about you is? It's that you're God's creation, that he loves you that you're a child of the king, that you have value, that you have purpose outside of what you do. Guess what? If you think that your value is in what you do or what you can offer other people, the minute that you have an, you know, maybe have an injury or the minute that you can't do those things for whatever reason, you lose your sense of value. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can't lose your value. Maybe in your eyes, but not in God's eyes. God sees you again your value is not in what you can do but rather who you are you are royalty in God's eyes don't let trauma rob you of the life that God has for you verse 9 the king called to Ziba Saul's servant and said to him I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and all and to all his house you therefore and your sons and your servants shall work for the land excuse me shall work the land for him you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat, but Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Not only does this guy go from living in the outskirts to not having royalty, to not having uh, you know, all of his uncles, right, to not having his grandpa, to losing everything, but now he's being welcomed into the king's house and he's saying, not only are you royalty, you're gonna sit and eat with me, you're gonna be taken care of, and Ziba is going, and his family, I know you can't work, but don't worry, they're gonna work and they're gonna bring you the produce, that you're gonna get the benefit of their labor because that's the kind of God that we serve. We serve of a God who wants to get us past our trauma, the kind of God who's in the business of restoration. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Man, that's a lot of kids, right? A lot of people in one house. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons like one of the king's sons. David adopted him as his own. He's like, you're gonna be treated just like my sons are treated. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both feet. Guess what? His physical condition didn't change. But you know what? He was established. He, was, he had moved past that. Doesn't mean that it never happened. Doesn't mean that there, there wasn't, uh, you know, that life wasn't different, right? Th those things happened, right? Trauma happens. But I'll tell you this, God wanted to set Mephibosheth chef free from the prison of his trauma. Yes, he was still lame in both feet, but that doesn't mean that he didn't have a story to tell of God's goodness. Yes, I went through a car accident. You know, I can't change that that happened to me. That happened. Yes, you've been through some trauma. You can't change what happened to you. You can't change how it played out, but you know what? You don't have to live stuck there. God wants you to be able to move past that and to see that his hand was upon you even in the midst of the bad. God is so, so good. Point number three is this, is that God wants to set you free from the prison cell of your trauma. Yes, it happened, but God worked in spite of it all. Yes, we've been through some things, right? Yes, I was stuck in my prison cell of trauma at some point. I was stuck in this pastureless isolation just like Mephibosheth, but the king found me, and the king brought me out of Lodabar from living in the outskirts, and he brought me to his table, and he gave me a new identity, and he adopted me as, my, as his own, and he said, you are my son, you are my daughter, and from now on, you will sit here. Your life is not marked by your trauma. Your life is marked by royalty because you're a child of the king. 
Now, I, I, now we get to sit at the table of the king. That's what Jesus does for us. He brings us to the table. You know, I tell everyone in my story of how God intervened on our behalf. Yes, there was trauma. Yes, there, this was a life-changing experience. But you gotta know God was working through the whole thing. If I can sit down with each one of you and just share all that God did through that accident, you would be amazed at, at the kind of God that we serve. One miracle I'll share with you, we, took, we got to Lancaster, we knew that the weather was gonna be bad, we took all our music gear out of the truck and we put it in the church van. Well, guess what car got into the accident? The truck. But here's something amazing. I felt that after the accident, the Lord revealed to me the reason we moved all our gear into the other car is one, he spared all of that gear, and two, because we were all gonna use our instruments again for his glory. God gave me that word when my friends are hanging on to the, in, li in life support. It wasn't when I saw it with my physical eyes. He put that in my spirit so that I could hold on to that word. So I didn't have to be stuck in trauma. I tell the story of what God has done. How God has healed us. You know? How God helped me process through my trauma and, and not get stuck there but move forward. God helped set me free from the prison cell of trauma that the enemy wanted me to stay in. I don't know what you're going through today, but I know that the enemy would love to keep you stuck in your trauma. I know that the enemy would love to keep you stuck in the prison cell. He likes it when you're stuck. In fact, Jesus even said in John 10, 10, the thief does not come uh, except to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have life more abundantly. Jesus came to give you life more abundantly. The enemy's the one who came to rob you. He wants you stuck. He's like, yeah, that hurts, doesn't it? Let's keep pondering it. Let's think about how traumatic it was. Let's focus on all that anxiety and, and the fear that it's gonna happen again. Let's just, let's just stay stuck in this event. Let, let's get mad at God for ever letting it happen to you. You know, well, if he's a good God, why would he let, that's the enemy speaking lies to you. God is saying, you know what, in this life you will go through stuff, but I promise you that I will be with you through it and I will keep my hand upon you. It could have been so much worse, but I will work even in your trauma to show you that I am a God who works in all seasons and that I can bring you through every storm that the enemy sets in front of you, every roadblock that he puts in front of you. I'm a faithful God and I will take care of my kids. That's the kind of God that we serve. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, God says. I could have easily gotten stuck in my trauma, ladies and gentlemen. You know, in the healing process, there were still things that reminded me of that day, you know? We'd be driving on the freeway, I would see an embankment and I would just kind of remember, you know? Sometimes I, I would rather drive than be the passenger because it's the control factor, right? Well, if I'm in control, then, then maybe I can help it not to happen again. There's a healing that takes time that the Lord can do in all of us and the Lord has been doing that healing on me for 12 years now and I'm in a really good place because of God. I'm not stuck in that prison cell. No, I have a testimony. I see God's hand upon my life and my friends' lives. They should not be here today. Those two boys who were ejected out of the vehicle, I didn't tell you, they're alive. They're alive. They're alive, they love Jesus, you know? Doesn't mean that they don't have some hurdles that they gotta go through, but I'm telling you this. I was just texting with, with uh, one of the boys last night, one of my brothers, and I reminded him, I said, hey guys, you know, if you have any pictures, it'd be, be awesome if you could share it with me, you know? We're coming up on our 12 year anniversary. And he's like, man, I'll, I'll never forget, forever grateful, you know? Just so thankful of who God is and, and what he did, even in spite of that. Easily could have been stuck in trauma. He had a way worse experience than I did. My buddy Isaac went through, I mean, months of rehab. They, I literally remember his sister with tears in her eyes in the hospital saying, 
they don't know what to do. They, they basically said it, it, they're gonna do one last surgery. It's a last chance surgery. They're gonna relieve some of the, the pressure on his brain, the swelling, and they're gonna do this procedure. And if this doesn't work, they said there's nothing else that they can do. But I'm here to tell you, but God, but God, God intervened on our behalf. Isaac incrementally improved that surgery worked. No, it was God that worked, right? Through the surgeon. And guess what? He went to rehab. He had to relearn how to use his motor skills. Guess what? He was an amazing pianist before the accident. Guess what? He's still an amazing pianist. And now, now he has a story, a testimony, and he's giving devos. He's, he, you know, he's, he's just loving and serving Jesus. He could have stayed stuck but he allowed the Lord to work in spite of his trauma. And now God gets the glory and we have grown. And we're just in a different place. I want to share with you seven practical ways that you can get free from this prison cell of trauma. I want to tell you first and foremost, the greatest thing about all of this, everything else can be taken away, but God. God is the key to your healing, the key to your success, the key to everything, it's God, it's Jesus. He is the only one. Without that, everything else is, ah, it's, it's Band-Aid fix for surgery that you need. Jesus is the, is the one. I want you to know Jesus is the immor- most important in all of these things. But I would like to share with you, these are seven things that I believe helped me, and I believe they'll help you process your trauma, get free from your trauma. Number one is pray. Don't let pray be your, prayer be your last resort. Let it be your first response. God, I need you. God, I give this to you. God, this is bigger than me. Lord, help. Pray. Number two, pick someone to talk to. Pick someone to talk to, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a counselor, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a trusted friend. You Only you know what kind of help that you need. And so you need to talk to someone. I'll tell you this, there are, uh, it's, it's a scientific fact. You could see uh, brain scans. Just look into neuroscience. You can see the difference on an MRI, someone's brain who has compressed all of their trauma as opposed to somebody who has talked about their traumatic experience. I'll tell you this, there's healing in just talking about it. We got to get past that idea of the the war chest. Bury it deep down inside. Don't talk about it. Yeah, well, on an MRI, those areas of your brain are lighting up because it's not dealt with. It's under the surface, and eventually it will come out one way or another. It may come out in another way. A lot of times people self-medicate when they're suppressing. You don't need to self-medicate. Let's talk about it. Let's get it out in the open. Let's deal with it. Let's get healed from it so we can move past the prison cell of our trauma. Number three is this, prioritize self-care. It's amazing how important rest, exercise, and just having fun is. If you always work, always work, no rest, no fun, man, that's gonna take a toll on your healing. That's gonna take a toll on your life. You know, I can bring all these scenarios back to my car accident story. You know, that same day that we had that accident, believe it or not, I actually, later in the evening, went out to eat with my parents. And there was some therapy that happened with my parents at a little diner, just having food. You know, being able to talk and process. I prioritize self-care. Well, you know, some of my friends, they had no, they couldn't prioritize that. And sometimes we think it's selfish to take care of ourselves. It's healthy to take care of yourself. You know, before you help somebody else out, let's say the plane is going down. If you don't put your oxygen mask on first, how are you going to help somebody else get theirs on? A lot of times, let's just say you're underwater, right? You're you're swimming, you're trying to help other people, but you you don't have that oxygen tank on, you're not going to last very long. And you think it's selfish to do that. Put the mask on yourself first and then help others. It's okay to prioritize self-care. The fourth thing is this, uh, ponder the truth. The truth of God's word. Read the Bible. Look Look for 
God's hand in it because I guarantee you when you start to look for it, you're going to see it. God's hand was here. He did this. He protected here. It could have been worse, but it wasn't. I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. I got, you know, I got, I have air in my lungs today. God is on the throne. Start to look to God's word. Ponder the truth. Number five, partner, partner with your loved ones. Whether it's family, whether it's friend, partner with your loved ones. Lean on them for strength. I leaned on my family. Number six, position yourself to be in community with others. Position yourself to be in community with others. My church community, my church family came along and, and, and so did other churches where my buddies were in the hospital. I mean, we had a prayer chain going that was like across the nation. I mean, other churches would hear our story. They started referring to us as the Miracle Five, you know, and it's true. And it was, I drew strength from that. Pastor Rob, Pastor Bobby, they came to the hospital while I was there. They came to the waiting room. We, we prayed. We had worship in the waiting room. I mean, we had, we had church open there. It was awesome. Number seven, really important step, be patient. Be patient with your time frame for healing. There were things that took time. You may not get healed overnight. Sometimes God does supernaturally heal us in an instant, in a moment, in a worship service, in an encounter with God. That happens. God is very capable. But sometimes our, our healing is a process, and it takes time. Be patient with yourself in the healing process. Both of my friends that were critically injured are miraculously alive today. Now we have a testimony of God's faithfulness. And I'll tell you this, it, it took time. Some things came sooner than others, but other things, you know, it, it came over time. But we didn't give up. We trusted God. We trusted the Lord. You don't have to be stuck. That's what the enemy has for you. But God has come to give you life and life more abundantly. Would you stand to your feet? I just want to tell you this as I'm closing, that God wants to help you today so that your story is one of victory and not a story of victimization. God wants to give you a victory story of how you overcame, of how you were delivered, of how he set you free, on how he worked in spite of the trauma. But I'll tell you this, if we don't learn to get the right help for our trauma, then we will be stuck in our trauma. How long do you want to do life in the prison cell? How long do you want to remain stuck in the trauma, in the grief, in that place where something took place that shook you up? Because you were meant to be free. God wants to set you free this morning. He wants to start that process with you this morning. John 8, 36 says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be what? Free and free indeed. Most important step is getting God involved. Prayer partners, would you come forward today? We are going to be here at the front. We're going to be waiting to receive you. If you have, if you need prayer for anything, please come on forward as we sing this last song today. If God is tugging on your heart, if there's something you want to lay down at this altar, if there's something you need to get healed from, if there's some trauma that you need to just let go of, this is your moment to just give it to God. Get it out there and let God begin the process of healing. It's your time. Come forward today. Let us pray for you as we sing this last song.
desperate for you I surrender
got some stuff you need the Lord to help you process through and work through. Maybe you're not bold enough to come down here today, or maybe you didn't feel led to come down here. But if that's you, would you just slip your hand up? I'm going to pray for you right now, right where you are. Even if you're online, by faith, just raise your hand. God sees you. All right. Okay. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your children, Lord. I just thank you for these people who have raised their hands this morning. These that have, those that have come down to the altar, Father, I just pray for those raising their hands, those online, those at the altar, that you would help them to heal. Give them the victory over trauma, Lord. What the enemy meant for evil, for their destruction, turn it around for their good and for your glory, Lord. I pray for healing. I pray that we'd be a people who walk the walk and talk the talk, Lord Jesus. That we bring this stuff to you, God, because you are the one who can help us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would clean house today in our hearts. If there's any unprocessed trauma, if there's anything that we just feel stuck in, I pray deliverance today, Lord. Your word says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Everything that has a stronghold on us. And so, Lord, I pray that strongholds would be broken this morning. I pray that chains would be loosed in the name of Jesus. I pray that thinking patterns would be realigned, Lord Jesus. That hearts and minds would be uplifted. That burdens would be lifted off of their shoulders. God, I pray that people would get their rest in their sleep that these night terrors would not keep them awake anymore, that these would cease in the name of Jesus, that post-traumatic stress would cease in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would walk into our best days, Lord, that we would walk into our best days, that we'd put our best foot in front of us. Help us, Father, to take the necessary steps that we need to take to get better. And Lord, the first step and most important step is saying, God, we need you. And so, Lord, together today, we say we need you. Help us, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, amen. Real quick, before we go, we never want to close a service without giving you an opportunity to come to know Jesus if you don't know him. If you don't know the Lord Jesus and you want to invite him into your heart today, let me lead you in a simple prayer. Say this, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross and that you arose three days later. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to live for you from this moment forward to have a personal relationship with you from now until forevermore. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, we celebrate you. We have a Bible for you in our Welcome Center. We would love to connect with you. Please come see us and the rest of you. Lord, bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. In Jesus' name, go with God's blessing today. We'll see you out there, outside. If you need lunch, hey, there's some good tacos being made outside. It's our youth fundraiser. If a few of you guys can help, maybe take a few chairs off that back wall outside, that'd be great. We'll see you later. God bless.